Hi there, Phil Simborg, just returning from a fun weekend uh, in Cleveland, Ohio, ABT tournament, and uh, I was lucky enough to be teamed up uh, with a very fine young player from uh, uh, Hungary, Istvan Egger, uh, who is uh, a relatively new backgammon player and a student of the game, but he's learned well, and he helped me quite a bit throughout our doubles campaign, and we we're fortunate enough uh, to win the championship. And when I say fortunate, anybody who wins any time uh, has to have some good dice. Uh, no matter how good you are, uh, that's really needed. And we certainly had good dice at the right time. But I also think we played pretty well. Here is a position uh, that came up in the finals. We are white, and we have four points, and our opponents have five points. It's a match to seven, almost all doubles matches are played to seven. So in effect, we are three away. We need three points to win the match and our opponents need two points to win the match. And we are on roll and wondering whether or not we should double or not. And we weren't quite sure exactly what to do. And we apply the doubling cube process that I teach uh, all my students that I learned in the very first professional lesson that I ever paid for from Kit Woolsey many, many years ago. I think it's about a good, good 25 or 30 years ago now that I took my first lesson from Kit. And the first thing he taught me in our first lesson, I was, I was telling him I'd like to work on the cube first because I'm kind of perplexed about the cube. He said, well, let's use Woolsey's Law. <laughs> so uh, I get many students now and I teach him Simborg's Law, but I also first teach them Woolsey's Law cover Simborg's Law another time, but Woolsey's Law basically says if you're thinking about doubling, put yourself in your opponent's shoes and ask yourself what you would do if you were them. So Isvan and I did this and we talked about it. We said if we were red, would we take or would we drop and are we sure? The decision uh, of whether or not to give the cube becomes much easier if you first think about what it's like for the person taking the cube. And in this case, uh, in order to decide whether or not you should take or drop as red or any time whether you should take or drop, the first thing you need to know is what is your take point and how much do gammons matter? And then assess the position on the board. We happen to know that the take point for someone who is two away when their opponent is three away is about 26%. To be exact, it's 26.18 according to the latest a table provided by Neil Kazaros after playing hundreds of thousands of games out to determine the odds of winning the match at this point with two equal players who play perfectly. That's that's uh, a lot of assumptions, but we have to start somewhere. None of us play perfectly, but the take point really is about 26%, 26.18. And if the cube is turned on two, how much do gammons matter? Well, of course, we don't care uh, if we get gammoned after the cube is turned to two. And that's one incentive for us to turn the cube because our opponent needs two points and the cube is on two. So the gammon cost to us or the gammon value for our opponent is zero. However, if we win a gammon, we win the match. So the gammons have to be pretty important to us. However, the value of a gammon is always a number that compares the gammon to the value of winning or losing the game. And without getting into a lot of math, if we can just win two points here and we're winning then one away, two away Crawford, meaning he can't double for one game, we have a pretty big advantage in the game. We're actually about 68% uh, uh, chance of winning the match if we can just win two points. So it's pretty important to win. By the way, if we win a gammon, we win the entire match. So instead of 68%, we're at 100%. The difference of about 32 uh, percent is about half of the value that we have when we're at 68 percent which means that gammons are close to around 0.5 the actual specific number is 0.476 that's what a gammon is really worth so a little bit less than half so with that information we ask ourselves do we think red has enough to take or drop and are we sure well the answer in this case is we weren't sure we thought it might be close. We didn't know exactly how often red gets gammon, but he's got three checkers back on the ace point. We know that 
when you start the game with two checkers back on the ace point and the boards are even, you get gammoned around 14, 15%. So this has to be more than that. And in addition to these three checkers back on the ace point, we're shooting right now at another checker. If we roll a four or a two five, uh, we immediately will uh, get another checker back. And also we have some uh, ways to cause some, some havoc on this side of the board. If we were to roll a 5-3 and make this point, a 6-1 and make this point, double three, we got all kinds of good numbers on this side. And the, the downside is we could roll something bad, like a 2-1. Or 2-1 isn't so horrible, though we make this point. How about a 2-3? That's pretty bad. All kinds of numbers that don't make this point, this point, or this point, or hit this checker aren't that good for us. But we look like we have a lot of good numbers. So this is, this is the process that we went through to decide whether or not to give the cube. We actually did an estimate of what we thought our opponent's gammons might be. And we thought it was somewhere in the range of around 21%, 22%. And we thought it's probably going to be maybe a slight drop for them uh, based on gammons that high. Uh, and so we went ahead and we weren't sure whether or not they should take it. We thought it might be a drop, but we weren't positive. If, we're sh if we think it's a drop, then for sure it's a double. The only time you wouldn't double is if you think you might win too many gammons with very little risk of playing on to maybe win, the, win, win a gammon and win two points, as opposed to doubling and having your opponent drop and you only win one point. But we weren't really sure it was a drop. And anytime you're not sure it's a drop or a take, then again, for sure it's a double. That's the beauty of Woolsey's Law. Uh, by the way, if we were sure it's a take, it might still be a double. Then we would have to consider how often we might lose our market. And that's another lesson of determining market losers that uh, I have given in some other videos. And I'll get more deeply into that in another video. Uh, but in this case, we weren't really sure whether red should take or drop. So that made our decision very easy. We went ahead and gave the cube and left it to red. Uh, red, our opponents, uh, a very, very good team, one of the most experienced doubles teams in the world. They've won many tournaments. Uh, Doug Roberts and his wife, Wanda, <clears throat> who always wears a lucky hat that I gave her years ago, and she wears it to uh, tease me because uh, she calls it her lucky hat. So whenever she plays me, she wears it. Uh, and they're very fine players. And Doug himself uh, has won many tournaments and is a terrific player. So I knew we were up against tough opponents and we had to be precise. We took a lot of time and thought on this one. And Doug also took quite a bit of time, went through all the proper decisions and decided what to do. So before I give you the answer of what they do and what you should do, why don't you tell me uh, or tell yourself what you would do here? Would you take a drop if you're red? Okay, they dropped, and uh, I wasn't surprised, and I was happy. I took a picture of the position because I really wasn't sure, and I wanted to know for sure, and it turns out that they made a blunder dropping, and I might have made the same blunder because, again, I wasn't sure, and I sort of thought it was a drop myself. I thought you get gammoned a little bit too much, and, oh, it doesn't show it's a blunder at plus plus. Rolled out, it's uh, a blunder is... 8%, it's 7.4, so that's just a matter of semantics. It's a big mistake to drop. But is it really a big mistake? Again, I'll quote my good friend and uh, one of the greatest minds in the game, Kit Woolsey. He's, he believes it's not at all unusual for really, really fine players to make huge uh, cube errors. The cube is just that complicated and difficult. He believes that top players, or what we call the giants of backgammon, will not very often make very, very big blunders in their checker play. But in cube play, it's just too hard to get the numbers down, and it doesn't take uh, I mean, being off by much to be wrong. In this case, gammons, we were a little high on gammons. That's why I would have dropped. I thought you get gammoned a little bit more than 20.5% if you are red. We guessed around 22%, and that really is would be the difference. And that would, if it was 22%, and you multiply that times the correct gammon value of 0.476, and you add that to the take point of 26, you would come up with uh, too many losses, and you wouldn't have be able to win 
the game enough to take the cube. But it's just barely under that, and even just barely under that makes it into a blunder. If you take 20.5 and you multiply it times 0.475, you come up with, um, um, I don't remember exactly the number, but you would come up with uh, uh, a little bit under 10, about 9.5. If you add 9.5 to the take point of 26, you would come up with 35 and a half, and that would be your gammon adjusted take point. So if you can win the game more than 35 and a half percent of the time, you should take. Well, you can win this game 37.5 percent of the time. So uh, that's two percent more than what it takes to take this cube, and just a little two percent difference in your estimates of either the gammons or the wins turns out to be. A very very big mistake in a cube action and this is a pretty sizable mistake we were thrilled to get that point and go to double match point in effect two away two away where it's like playing double match point because if you're a decent player you're going to turn the cube very quickly uh, and it's going to be on two and the other team is going to take because it's you're probably going to double on the first or second roller very early and you're playing for the match so we got to double match point at a time where they would have had a more of an advantage by trying to play this game out and beat us in this game. Now, again, a really small percentage difference, 2% uh, in the total value, turns out to be a big mistake in equity. That's how much this game is a game of math. That's how complicated and difficult this game is to really master. And even the best players, and, and most will agree, who know Doug Roberts' game, is up there with it, as good as anybody just about and, and is a very sharp top player. And myself, I'm not too bad. And we might well have made mistakes in cubes like this, but we'll be closer than most people because we know all of the things that I just explained to you. I didn't just read these out of a book for this lesson. These are things that I know and use every day, teach every day. And if you don't know and use these theories, if you don't know take points, gammon values, and how to apply them, how to come up with a gammon adjusted take point and do an estimate, then you're playing backgammon at a lower level. You simply won't uh, advance your game that good. You'll never be a really strong uh, open level player. You can play this game by looking at this position and just say, oh, I think it might be a taker. It looks to me like a taker drop and just do it that way, which is the way most players do it. And you will always be an intermediate player. Very few players in the world can just eyeball a position and instantly know, unless it's obvious. Now, you know, you put one more checker back and we're all going to drop like uh, like crazy. You put this checker back here and we're not going to double. Uh, I mean, there's things that would make this position very obvious to a good player. But when you get to the edge like this, the difference between playing, uh, playing a good game of backgammon and playing really well is knowing these numbers and using these estimates. Now, the biggest question is, of course, we can all study and memorize take points or learn the formulas for how to derive take points so that at any time you can come up with that 26% or the gammon value of 0.476. That can be done by anybody. But how do you know, looking at this, that gammons are 20%, not 22%, that you can win the game 37% and not 33%? That's a matter of experience. That's a matter of practice. That's what the beauty is of extreme gammon. And that's why the better players today are more precise and there are more really top players today that play at a very, very high level than there were 25 and 30 years ago before we had these bots. We can now see exactly what the winning percentages are. The bot, in this case Extreme Gammon, is extremely accurate. That's why it's called Extreme Gammon, I guess. It's extremely good. So I hope this was enlightening to some of you. I think it's an interesting position. Uh, think about your own assessment here. How did you go about deciding whether to take or double? How would you do that in the future? And how can you improve your game with some of these ideas that we just discussed? Thanks for watching, and uh, we'll continue to post these videos regularly on the USBGF Facebook site for the exclusive use of USBGF members, another benefit of, mem of being a member. And don't forget to renew your memberships and help us encourage others to join. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye.